Thanks, Phil. Good morning, everybody. Welcome this morning, Bethany, both here within the walls of the sanctuary at Green Lake and also online if you're worshiping with us. It's a joy to be together in the new year and uh, Happy New Year to all of you. As is common at this time of year, some people think about New Year's resolutions and change and transformation. And toward that end, we have a, a two-week mini-series here entitled Habits for Wholeness uh, to look at what God has to say about the development of habits in our lives. And so uh, I'm going to invite you now to just pray with me, and then we'll look at what God could say so that we could be shaped to be people of hope in this world in the days ahead. Let's pray together. Father, thanks that we can gather within these walls listening for your voice, and we trust and pray and ask that your Holy Spirit would indeed uh, be our teacher, but especially today, Father, also would you make clear to us a single step that each of us could take uh, toward the development of a habit uh, that would lay the foundation for the work that you would like to do through us to bless the world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to begin by sharing a story a little bit at length from a book that's been helpful in my life entitled The Power of Habit by Charles Duhogg and um, why what we do in life and business matters. It's a, it's a good read. But he begins by sharing the story of a woman named Lisa Allen. Lisa was 34 years old. She'd started smoking and drinking when she was 16. She'd struggled with obesity most of her life. And at one point in her mid-20s, collection agencies were hounding her to recover $10,000 in debt. And old resumes listed her longest job as lasting less than a year. And now, because of the profound transformation in her life, she has become uh, the object of study among scientists who are trying to understand how people change, right? And so she's interviewing with these scientists, and they ask her this question, how long since your last cigarette? One of the physicians asked. Uh, Almost four years, she said. And I've lost 60 pounds and run a marathon since then. And then they said, explain to us your pathway of transformation, because it's pretty profound. So then she shares her story. She said, well, um, I came home one night, and uh, my husband told me that he was leaving me because he was in love with another woman, and it took me a while to process the betrayal and absorb the fact that I'm going to be divorced. And then there was this period of mourning, and then a period of rage where I uh, began to obsessively spy on him, follow his new girlfriend around town. I'd call her after midnight and hang up. And then one night, I showed up at his girlfriend's house, drunk, pounding on the door, screaming, I'm going to burn the house down. And then in the classic understatement of all time, this is what she writes, that was not the best of times for me. (laughs) And then, so then, follow this, she says, you know, I'd always wanted to see the pyramids in Egypt and my credit cards weren't maxed out. So I bought a ticket and flew, flew to Cairo out of nowhere, right? She wakes up in the motel so disoriented and drunk that she tries to light a cigarette but had grabbed her pen by mistake and lit a, a pen on fire and smelled the melting plastic and then so crying and she just realized her entire life was out of control And then didn't enjoy that trip to Egypt so much, but on the way to the airport, she said to herself, I'm going to come back and trek to the pyramids. I'm going to walk to the pyramids out of Cairo. Crazy idea. She knew she was out of shape, overweight, and broke. Uh, Didn't even know the name of the desert she was looking at or if it was possible to do this. But she just decided she was going to do it. Gave herself one year to prepare. Step one was this. She said, if I'm going to walk that far, i got to quit smoking. Well, quitting smoking set in motion a cascading of events. She replaced smoking with jogging. That, in turn, changed how she ate, worked, slept, saved money, scheduled her work, uh, planned for the future, and so on. So uh, that single choice then led ultimately to the running of a half marathon and then a marathon. Then she went back to school, got a degree, bought a house, got engaged, and eventually was recruited by scientists who discovered when they looked at her brain that there was this neural pathway that was predisposing her toward destructive choices. And that neural pathway had literally been rebuilt and overridden 
with a new pathway so that now, you know, she's a runner, making healthy food choices, healthy sexual choices, like a total transformation. And it all started with one habit. I'm going to go for a little walk instead of smoking a cigarette. And the walk became a jog, and the jog became a run, became a half marathon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, habits are powerful, right? And, and so for her, she had a goal, uh, walk to the pyramids. Now, I'm going to begin our discussion about habits by declaring to you preemptively, I don't know you very well, many of you in the room, but I will just say this to you. If you're here and you love Jesus, you already have a goal. It's not given to you by me or Eric or Scott or Bethany or your spouse or your coach, or your spiritual director, your boss. Like your foundational leader is Christ. And as the text we just read in Isaiah indicates, you are created for a life of fruitfulness. That's your goal. You're, made, you're called to bear fruit fruit of a transfer, transformed life that leads to a fruit of influence, right? So in a world of sickness, some of you are called to heal. <clears throat> in a world that's ignorant, some of you are called to teach. In a world of brokenness, some of you are called to be the presence of mercy and compassion. All of us are called to be the presence of wisdom and, and, and hope and justice and generosity in a world like thirsty for those very things, more so every year, it seems to me. So the church can only realize that goal if we who make up the church are living into our individual callings, and that can only happen if we're being transformed so that we're progressively displaying more and more the character of Christ. And what I will show you this morning and next week is that your pathway of transformation must include the development of habits, right? So if I say to you, you need to be transformed so that you can live a life of uh, hope and mercy and influence in the world and be, you know, freed from your own destructive tendencies, y your question might be, well, what do I need to do so that this transformation can happen? And I would tell you, that's the wrong question because what you need to do is already given to you. And if you don't go after what God has revealed, then you're going to try and figure out on your own what to do to lead to transformation. And if you, know, if you want to know how overwhelming and discouraging and, and profitless that endeavor is, just uh, search, uh, type self-help into like the search bar at Amazon and watch how many books, you know, come up. And, and a problem, frankly, in our hyper-individualized culture is that we leave it to our, it's left to us, each of us individually, to figure it out. How do I become the best version of me? Or to put it in Jesus' terms, how do I become fruitful, right? How do I live the abundant life? And so now we got to make choices. And so, you know, we go to classes, we buy books, we go to conferences, we listen to podcasts. We get, you know, meditation apps for our phone. And we hope that something is going to work. And sometimes some things do work. But our life then uh, the pessimist in me defines your life this way. You've got this, you know, massive amount of obligation that constitutes every day, right? You've got kids. You've got to prepare food. That means you have to shop for food. That means you have to drive. You have to park. You have to unload food. You have to bring food in. That means you create garbage. You have to take garbage out. You have to do dishes. You have to work. You have to bring in an income. You have to balance the books. You have to pay the taxes. You have to shop for Christmas. You have to put on Christmas. You have to recover from Christmas. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. And then in, that, in that, like, that panoply of obligations, there's this little tiny table for your well-being. And then there's this kind of neon flashing sign, here's your choices figured out. And the table is just, just, just full of tiny little things. So then with that two hours you have every day, you're like this, Netflix or CrossFit? Small group or the pub? Video games or cook a gour gourmet meal, Peloton or yoga, Bible reading or meditation, uh, you know, bo body, soul, spirit class at Bethany or um, Little League. Like, figure it out. Good luck. There's an easier way, okay? And, and so the liberating truth in Scripture is that God has revealed a path for us to be on if we're to experience ongoing transformation. And the path is not legalistic. And so narrow that it's culturally bound to Israel or the first century. But there are principles 
And what I want to do today and next week is help you mine the principles from which we can develop habits, right? And so there's going to be three truths that we look at this morning. Uh, truth number one, creation is ruled by habits. I'm going to make the case for habits by showing you that creation is uh, ruled by habits. Truth number two, God calls us to habits. Truth number three, here are the habits, right? The, the, the third truth. So let's begin here. Prove to me, Richard, that God cares about habits. Thank you for asking. Now, let's look at this. Uh, here's the first thing you look at. If you, wanna, if you wonder if, if, if habits are important, look at creation. Well, we start in Genesis 1. God created, and then it says there was evening and morning, day one, and then the pattern develops. Evening and morning, day two, day three, day four, day five, day five you know, evening and morning. Evening and, and so it has ever been, evening and morning. Like the sun is not thinking, should I rise this morning? It just happens. It's a habit of creation. It's a habit, actually, not because the sun is rising, as you know, but because the earth is um, spinning. And the earth is never, uh, if I can uh, anthropomorphize the earth for a moment here, the earth is never thinking, should I stop spinning for a few minutes? It just, it just is that way. There are habits built into creation, right? And, and uh, so... We have evening and morning. We have days, the habits of days. We have the habits of seasons. And what we discover when we look at the habits of seasons is the habits of seasons invite us to habits of rest and receiving and giving. I'll give you an example. Think of trees, particularly trees that lose their leaves, right? But all trees have this principle. Uh, when the days get longer, and they are starting to get longer now, because remember God said in Genesis 9, there's going to be seasons, Right? You have, you know, seed time, like you plant the seed, and you have the, you have the harvest, you have the sowing, you have the reaping. So there's a, there's a se- there are seasons, and the further north you are, the more pronounced those seasons are. And we have the privilege, in my opinion, of living in the further, further uh, north latitude, the northernmost latitude city in the lower 48, right? So of the big cities, we're higher north than Minneapolis and Chicago and Boston, all those places. But we're up here, and because of that, like yesterday as I'm driving in, I hear this super depressing news on KUOW. Uh, Sun will be setting today at 441 and rising at 750 or something like that. And I'm like, really? This is longer? It's already, this is better? And yet it is better, and it's getting better. And pretty soon, the trees will wake up, right? There's a plant, I think it's still across the street, in our little planter box. It's called February Dafting. And it's the first thing you'll smell that's a sign that hope springs eternal, right? Like longer days are coming. You'll smell February Dafting. And it's beautiful. What's happening is as the days get longer, then uh, the plants kind of, again, anthropomorphizing, they wake up, they begin to draw a resource from the soil, and they begin to pr- produce new leaves, and there's chlorophyll, and there's carbon, and there's sugars, and there's, and there's nutrients, and all of that happens so that the trees can create pollen, and the pollen happens so that the, 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 the birds can come and do what they do, and pretty soon, now we have new trees even, right? Why? Because there's a rhythm of rest and receiving and giving in creation. And, and, and so... Uh, Duhog in his, you know, habit book, he says, every habit, you can identify a cue that leads to an action that leads to a reward. So for the trees to begin uh, proliferating again, their cue is longer days. It's not the temperature, it's longer days. And when there's more light, they begin to, pro- they begin to produce and then what the trees have received from that production by drawing nutrients from the soil leads then to the, the giving of, of, of new life. And the reward is the earth goes on, right? And, and so there's these habits in creation. And then, you know, we can learn from that. My wife and I have similar habits of creation where we live because we live at the pass, I-90, where we get like 10 feet of snow every year. And, and we heat our house with wood. So we have a cue uh, when, um, when we can see the ground. Last year, it was Flag Day, June 15th. When we can see the ground, that's a sign. Time to start 
cutting wood. And there's wood waiting right now to be cut. It's buried under feet of snow. But soon, you know, in June, I'll see the wood. And then it's like, you know, fire up. That's the cue. And what's the habit? I don't have to think about, is it Netflix or yoga or meditation? It's wood. Like from June to August. I got a free hour, I'm cutting wood or splitting wood. My wife has a free hour, she's stacking wood or hauling wood. And then if it's September and the days are shorter, got to get the wood under the deck and put the new wood out to be cut for the next winter. It's all become a habit. But it's, there's a cue and there's an action, you know, bomb, 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 haul, you know. And then there's a reward and the reward is it's not 55 in the house. It's 65 or 70, right? That's the way it works. Cue, habit, reward. So God has built creation this way. I have a cue, coffee in the morning. Just saying it. Makes me need more. And then action for me, scripture and meditation, and then the reward. I just have this um, uh, quiet belief that God's transforming me and with me. Life's still messy. I blow it all the time. I'm dealing with my own demons and shadows, all whatever. But there's a quiet belief. God's taking me on a journey, right? It comes from the habit. It's the reward of the action of Scripture meditation and lower blood pressure, by the way. And that, but the cue is coffee, right? So, so coffee, cue, action, Scripture meditation, reward. So creation is ruled by habits. Second, God calls us to habits. Um, we're going to go through some of these habits very quickly. The habit of Sabbath is articulated in Leviticus 23.3, but it begins in Exodus 16, and it, it's also in the creation narrative in Genesis uh, 2. But God's desire is to create a habit of Sabbath. It's built into creation. And when God gives the law to Moses, it's one of the laws, and it's, it's actually the only law that I'm aware of, that also applies to all the animals. So God says, hey, the Sabbath, key to the Sabbath, is not just for you guys, it's for everybody in your house and even your animals, which would be your tractor in contemporary culture. So God is trying to say here something, which is what? Ha Sabbath means stop. Now we're going to get into this more. Sabbath's what we're going to deal with at the end here more extensively. But it's an illustration of God's desire that Israel live differently in a, in a world where all the nations are living on a basis of fear and slavery and oppression and, and no rhythm of work and rest. I am calling you to a habit of Sabbath so that you stand as a sign of something utterly different. And by the way, not just different, life-giving, right? The Sabbath is given to give you life. So God gives us the Sabbath. It's intended to be a habit. God calls us to a rhythm of sleep. It's intended to be a habit. Psalm 4.8. Psalm 127. Uh, where, and my favorite New Testament scripture, one of them in the narratives, is where Jesus is asleep in a boat in a wicked storm. If you've ever taken a ferry during a thunderstorm, when the waves are crashing over the bow, you know sleep's hard to come by in bad weather in a boat. And here's Jesus sleeping in the boat. Like, I want to sleep like that. That's a good way of sleeping. And, and we're invited to a place of rest, right? As a habit. Receiving revelation, very important, as a habit. Deuteronomy 6, God says, hey, I'm giving you the law. Now, you know, tie it on your uh, hat or your hair or whatever. Put it on the door. Speak of it. When you wake up, when you go to bed, at the dinner table, wh what is God teaching you? Make it a habit to talk about right? And then uh, the great manifesto of habits, in my opinion, in the Old Testament is Leviticus 23, which is kind of this, uh, this whole articulation of the festivals that God creates for the nation of Israel. So let me just read the opening verse, and then we'll look at some of these festivals. But here's God. The Lord spoke to Moses, and he said, speak to the sons of Israel this, quote, the Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed times are these. 
In other words, God is saying, look, over the year, over the course of a year, there's going to be the 15th day of the first month and the third day of the second month and the seventh day of the third month or whatever are the days. But it will be clear to you, that's your cue. And on that day, here's a festival to remind you of who you are. And there's seven of them, right? So we just go through these real quickly here in the, in the, in the thing. Seven celebrations. The Passover is the first one. It's a receiving habit, giving us the confidence that God is continually delivering us. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, the second festival. Uh, the third festival, the festival of first fruits. The fourth, the Feast of Pentecost. The fifth, the Feast of Trumpets. The sixth, the, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. The seventh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Each one, you know, ripe with meaning. God is saying to a nation, I want you to have habits that remind one another and the surrounding world of the character of the true creator of the universe. Habits. So, you know, Phil read Isaiah 5 and... and um, the articulation, God's frustration that Israel's not being fruitful. And then, you know, if you unpack the minor prophets, you see that one of two problems uh, would happen with respect to habits. Either Israel didn't do them at all, some of the habits were just ignored, or some of them were done uh, uh, perfunctorily or just like as a formality, but without bringing our whole self to it, right? And, and so for habits to be meaningful, they need to be done consistently, but we got to bring ourselves to the table as well and make it, make it meaningful, right? So, so then, uh, if I built a case for habits through creation and the articulation of what God has shown Israel in the Old Testament, I could go through New Testament as well and will next week. Let me just now give you an overview of the habits that we're talking about. So to do that, I'm going to show you a little uh, thing here. This is an ecosystem. This week, we're going to talk about the rest habits. Next week, we're going to talk about the receiving habits and the giving habits. For each of the habits that we talk about, I'm also writing a little further Bible study on, on spiritualbody.org so you can access more data there if you're interested and more resources if you want to develop any particular habit. But it's an ecosystem like three legs of a stool. You're not called to just rest. That's laziness, right? Uh, but in our fear of laziness in Western culture and our fear that, you know, we're not going to have enough, for most of the room, the problem isn't that we rest too much. That we have problems with a lack of rest that then affects our capacity to receive. Because in order for me to receive anything, my cup needs to be empty. And so rest empties my cup, right? We'll get into this in a minute. But then with an empty cup, now I, mean, I, now I have space in my life to receive. Oh, what does God have to say? And now if I receive what God has to say, that's transformative to me, and I'm fortified and now I'm better able to give, right? Use my gifts, live into my calling, practice hospitality, be generous, do justice. I can't, I can't give what I don't have, but I can't have what I haven't received, but I can't receive if my cup's already full of Netflix and yoga and CrossFit and Seahawks and skiing and taxes and Christmas and Easter and Valentine's Day and Super Bowl parties, you know, followed by uh, uh, Academy Awards, followed by March Madness, followed by opening day with the Mariners who are going to be good this year, <laughs> followed by, followed by, followed by, and I wake up and I'm dead. And I never did anything because my cup was always so full. Are you with me? This is a problem in Western culture. It just is. So um, that's why we're going to spend a little more time on rest now. In fact, a little more, actually six minutes and 35 seconds. Here we go. So everything starts with rest. Creation declares this rhythm of work and rest, you know, day and night. And all the scripture, God calls us to this regular rhythm of emptying our cup. That's the Sabbath. That's fasting. 
That's solitude. That's sleep. That's silence. So what rest does is it clears the deck and gives you the capacity to receive and absorb revelations from God about God's love and God's power and your identity in Christ and, and, and your call to generosity and you can relax because I'm taking care of you. We don't learn any of that if our cup's already full. So we need space. We need rest, right? So all of these are important. Sleep, fasting, solitude, silence, Sabbath. But even within this category of rest, I would argue that the mother of all of those, like the headwaters, is Sabbath. And the reason I'd argue that is because the word Sabbath literally means, uh, you know, to cease, to stop. So Sabbath is resting, but it's more than just resting. It's, it's sweeping away this table of obligations. <clears throat> saying, right now, no. No. And now the, the table's empty. And I'm able to say, God, what do you want from me? Or I'm able to, you know, I mean, there are times when until that table is empty, we're not even asking the right questions. I, uh, it's been like a year since I shed the senior leader role. And about a year ago, I called a, you know, spiritual director. I want to talk to him about my future and what should I do with the rest of my life and all this stuff, right? And uh, he said to me, because I had I had articulated, I've got all these goals. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ski half a million vertical feet, and I'm gonna start a coaching thing, and I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna travel more and speak, and I'm gonna go and go and go. And then uh, he just then the phone was kind of silent, or the the Zoom was silent, or whatever it was. And he's looking, and I'm waiting for him to speak, and then he says, "You already sound tired. Are you tired?" And I started to cry. No one had asked for 20 years, maybe. Yeah, I'm tired. And I didn't even, I wasn't even asking the right question until <laughs> the deck was clear. Are you with me? So this is a deal. This is Sabbath. It's a gift to you. Mark, tw- Mark 2 is this articulation of the disciples going through a field on the Sabbath, and they see some grain, and they pick it. And then there's these religious guys right there. Oh, look at you, you know, breaking the law. And my paraphrase, but Jesus is like, shut up. Like, come on. The Sabbath is a gift from God to you. It's not intended to be something you work at. It's intended to be something that you, like, you clear the deck. And then once you have the faith and courage to do that, you're like this, oh, I, I needed this, and I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it until I cleared the deck. But man, you know, in our Western culture, we have, when I studied architecture, uh, my, one of my instructors used to say, you know, architecture is half art, and I would do, draw stuff. And he'd go, Richard, you have horror vacui. I go, what's that? Just get the fear of empty spaces, man. You got to fill up every piece of the page. Stop. The empty space is beautiful. We got horror vacuum as a culture, right? Can't have any empty space. You got to go from thing to thing to thing. And then we're never even asked the questions, let alone receiving the answers. So Sabbath is a way of stopping, right? It holds space for us to remember who we are and reclaim the image we bear how we're called to live differently. It reminds us of our identity in Christ. So everything begins with this foundation of rest. And, and the reason I think uh, Sabbath is like the first principle is because all of these principles are easier and can be built into your Sabbath practice, right? All these other rest practices. So sleep, some people for Sabbath, they take naps on the Sabbath and only on the Sabbath. Like they're like, yep, this is my day when I get a good, a good nap. Well, that's good because uh, during sleep, you rebuild your body. And during, your, during sleep, you like those, those neural pathways that Lisa built to become a marathoner, th- those neural pathways are, are not built while you're waking and running. They're built while you're sleeping. And you're like, some of your pain in life is brought to the surface while you're sleeping so that you can then talk to somebody. 
Sleep's super important and valuable, right? So maybe you need, maybe your next step this year is, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna get seven hours of sleep every night. Oh wow, that'll change me. That'll mean no screens after 8 p.m. And that'll mean no terrible self-image because I'm not on Instagram worrying about what everybody else is doing. And that'll, that'll mean a fuller heart and that'll mean waking up rested. Wow, just a cascade just from saying I'm going to have seven hours. Or maybe you don't fast from food this year. Maybe you just say on the Sabbath, I don't look at social media or emails. Boy, that'll lower your blood pressure right there, right? And then, if, boy, throw news in, and you'll become Jesus in 10 minutes. <laughs> because you, like, you won't be so overwhelmed with things over which you have no control anyway. And, uh, and then, you know, when you're silent, you hear. I like to take people hiking. Sometimes staff members will come up and go on a hike. And I'll say, now, for the next little bit, we're not talking. And then people will share, well, what did you hear? Oh, this was from last spring. Oh, I heard the snow melting because I heard the streams. And then I stopped and started to cry once. I remember. Because I had, I had to ask, what do I need to allow to melt in my life to let go of? And I wouldn't have heard it had we been talking about the Seahawks. So maybe you build into your Sabbath a little bit of silence. So without these spaces of rest, we can't receive. We can't receive. Our cups are em empty or filled with, you know, obligations of our own making. And we're, we're, re we're living in a video game. We're reacting to what's coming at us rather than proactively being people of blessing. So, you know, I just close with this. How are you going to create rest habits in 2023? And in the, another book, not this one, Power Habit, but another book called Atomic Habits, I love that the author speaks to those in the room who hate habits. And I know in a room this size, there are some of you in the room who are like, nope, not for me. I'm not a habit person. I just go with the flow. I like it to be free and easy. And he says, you know, that's just kind of a veneer that's carrying up a fear of failing at habits, Right? He says, no, A, don't, a, don't worry about failing. It's better to try and fail and not try. But B, habits are supposed to be incremental little steps, right? So Lisa just decides she's going to quit smoking and says she's got a house and is married and lost 60 pounds and has run two marathons. One little thing. So what one little step can you take to make a Sabbath that's consistent and meaningful? The cue could be your Sunday or your Friday if you're working on Sundays or whatever it is for you. The day could be the cue. It could be evening. It could be two hours. It could be a half day. But in this time, uh, I will shut off my computer and listen to the birds and take a nap or take a bath or go to a massage therapist or read my Bible, one verse. But I will do this so that I can clear the deck so that God is free to speak to me. Because I live in a world where God is always speaking, but I'm not always listening. And there are so many other voices I can't often hear. One step, what, not a big step, a little step. And if we take a little step of rest and a little step of receiving and a little step of giving, we put ourselves on a pathway 2 Corinthians 3, from glory to glory to glory to glory, looking more and more and more like Jesus in a world desperately needing the presence of Christ that you can be. Doesn't that sound exciting for 2023? It does for me. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this congregation. I want to thank you for your ongoing kind of eternal invitation to walk with you. And I'm just so thoroughly convinced from the scripture and from saints sitting in this room right now, I'm convinced that walking with you is transformational. It fills us with hope and generosity and mercy, capacity to forgive ourselves, to love others, to cross social divides. But it begins with rest. And Father, there are some in the room who are exhausted. <laughs> 
and looking ahead with battles, family battles, cancer battles, money battles, political battles, school battles, study battles, body image battles. Before we fight, (laughs) would you reveal to each one of us a step we can take to put down our weapons and just rest? And we'll thank you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.